that she comforts me when I'm when I'm sad. How she cooks. She loves me. She tickles me. Read Bible. Read her Bible. A shop. She likes to hang out with her friends. She likes to play cards. She likes to sew. Um, and she really likes to laugh and to make people laugh. I like to cook with her. Play games and snuggle when I'm tired. I like playing with fun, helping her. Charlie, leave your sister alone. I clean up. Get off your electronic. I love you. I love when you're smart and goody. Go to the room and play. Kind of like this. to the moon and the sun and the stars. Good morning, PSBC family, and happy Mother's Day. To all our mothers out there, we appreciate all you do. We hope that this will be a special day for you. We also want to thank everyone for joining us online today, and we are looking forward to a meaningful time of worship this morning. If you are new to PSBC, we'd love to hear from you, and here are some ways to do that. If you are watching by Facebook or YouTube, you can find a Connect link in the description, or you can go to our website and click on the Connect link there. That's psbchurch.net forward slash connect. Again, thanks for tuning in. Let's pray for our time of worship. Father, as we come to you today, we just thank you for the ability and the technology that we have to stay connected as a church family. Uh, Father, today is a special day, for it is Mother's Day. And so we just lift our mothers up and we just thank them for all they do and just they have such a special place in the home. But, Father, today we also want to lift you up. For today we are worshiping you. We lift our voices in song, and in a minute we're going to hear your word open up and just flow over us. And we just pray that we will uh, apply those words to our life to where we can better minister to the community that you have us in. And, Father, we are looking so forward to the day that we get to come back together as a church family. But until then... Father, we're going to lift you up. Even in the days of uncertainty, in the days we might have questions, Father, we know that you are always in control and that you love us. Father, be with this service. And in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all sing with us and praise the Lord today. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory
in reading the scripture of the month. It'll be on the screen in front of you. Read it with us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. Church, isn't it a wonderful blessing and a wonderful thought to know that we can walk free from our sin, free from guilt and punishment. We have no condemnation. We are righteous only because of what Christ has done. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 tells us that he is our high priest, our mediator, who can sympathize with our every weakness because he's walked in our shoes. He's been tempted and tried just as we have. So let's trust this great Savior. Let's trust him. He is a wonderful friend like no other. Y'all join us and sing with us. No, not one.
reminder of the friend we have in Christ. He's the friend. He's the only one that can satisfy the needs of our souls. If you are hungering today, thirsting spiritually, look to Him. Don't try to find delight in your circumstances. Find delight in the Savior.
our custom on Mother's Day. Our mission focus is Paulding Pregnancy Services. Uh, they're a great local ministry partner that serve women and families uh, in our area who are experiencing unexpected pregnancies. And they advocate, of course, for life-giving choices. Uh, we would normally begin our baby bottle drive today, but due to our circumstances, we're not able to distribute those. However, you can still collect change in any container of your choice. Uh, now through June 21st, Father's Day, uh, you can bring those collections in. Uh, you can also drop them off at the church office any day of the week from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, we'll make sure that all of those get to Paulding Pregnancy Services. Paulding Pregnancy has also uh, made available a link online that you can take advantage of if you would like to give directly to them. Uh, that website is ppsfriends.org. That's Paulding Pregnancy Services Friends, ppsfriends.org. And you will also be able to find that link in our weekend email update that comes from our church office. And we do want to show our support for this vital ministry in our community. So let's, uh, let's do that, and let's pray for them at this time. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we lift up this great ministry, Paulding Pregnancy Services, who are on the front lines advocating for life. We just pray that you would bless their leadership, bless them in every way, Lord, provide for them uh, financially and in personnel and in every way. And Lord, even in this time, I know they have uh, tried to continue offering their services, uh, counseling over the phone, and we just know that they are uh, doing everything possible to continue uh, fighting for life. And we just pray that you would bless them, continue to work through them. Uh, may the gospel be spread through their efforts. And may uh, the lives of many children be saved through their efforts. We just thank you for them and, and their efforts, and we pray that you would continue to bless them. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today, uh, I know many of you probably have already picked up on this. Uh, we record our services earlier in the week for streaming purposes to make sure that our stream continues as you are viewing there. Um, and on the day that we recorded, our, our pastor was um, a little under the weather. He was sick today. So um, bringing the message today is Dr. Jason Loudermilk. Um, Y'all, many of you know him. He's a member here. He's also our uh, West Metro mission strategist. So we're glad to have him be able to, to uh, fill in. And uh, at this time, we're going to enjoy a choir special from our children's choir uh, that they have put together. And especially on Mother's Day, we know that'll be a great blessing to you. Um, but after that, we'll enjoy a message from Dr. Jason Loudermilk. Son of God and Son of God. 
Thank you, Children's Choir, for sharing with us on this Mother's Day and uh, reminding us that our longing is for Christ. And uh, thank you to all those who submitted their videos. What a blessing to be able to worship together as uh, we see you singing to the Lord. To all of our moms today, we want to say Happy Mother's Day. And uh, it is such a a blessing to know that we can honor and celebrate you uh, this day as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12 today. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Have you ever found yourself asking the question, God, what is your will for my life? What is it that you want to do with my life? Or or what is your will uh, for this particular situation? Sometimes we want to know, and sometimes we think we know for sure. Consider this story. There was a bishop of a century ago who pronounced from his pulpit and in the periodical that he edited, that heavier-than-air flight was both impossible and contrary to the will of God. Oh, the irony that Bishop Wright had two sons, Orville and Wilbur. He was wrong. It was not God's will that we fly. He was sure of himself, but he was wrong. I think too many times we can get very sure of what we think God wants for our lives And we forget to ask God himself. And so today we're going to look in his word and ask the question, God, what do you want from me? What does God want from me? What does God want to do with my life? We're in Proverbs chapter 3. 
We're going to be reading verses 1 through 12. The verses will be on your screen this morning. Beginning in verse 1, he says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. And may the Lord add his blessing this morning to the reading and the proclamation of his word. As we look at these 12 verses uh, in Proverbs chapter 3, there are some that are very familiar to us. We've heard many times, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. But as we look through it, it fits within the context of these verses. And so as we think about what God is calling us to, particularly as we evaluate so much of our lives during this time of this global pandemic, I believe that there are five things that we can see in this passage of Scripture that God answers the question what His will is for our lives. So as we ask the question, God, what do you want from me? What is your will for my life? The first thing that we see in these verses is that God wants me to obey Him. God wants me to obey Him. And the truth of the matter is that I cannot obey God if I ignore His commands. It's not possible for us to be obedient to God while at the same time ignoring what He has commanded us to do. When we forget His teachings. He begins in verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. And so God has given us Uh, His word, He has given us His commandments, and obedience requires that we not ignore them, but instead follow them closely. Heard the story of Roger Staubach, who led the Dallas Cowboys to the World Championship in 1971. And he admitted that his position as a quarterback, who didn't call his own signals, was a source of trial and frustration for him. Coach Landry sent in every play. He told Roger when to pass, when to run, and only in emergency situations could he change the play, and he had better be right when he did. Even though Roger considered Coach Landry to to have a genius mind when it came to football, Pride said that he should be able to run his own team. But Roger later said this, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. That's so true for the Christian life. If we're going to uh, see God's will worked out in our lives, we've got to learn to obey. And I, I, I cannot obey God if I'm not guarding my time with Him. We're to keep His commandments. Keep. It, it, that idea, uh, that, that word can also mean to guard or protect. It's the idea that, that when we uh, are, are devoted to our relationship with the Lord, our heart desire is to guard and keep His commandments, to honor them with our lives, to obey Him in every scenario. Ultimately, I can only have peace and eternal life through faith in Jesus, uh, which leads me to obey. My obedience is not born out of some ability within myself. Our obedience comes because we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Our right relationship with God is not because of our actions. It's not because of our obedience, but instead our obedience is born out of our faith in Jesus Christ. So as we think about this, that that what God's will for our lives, what His will for my life is to obey Him, we come to a time of confession. And what I want you to do as we go through each of these points is to ask yourself the question, Lord, what do I need to do to honor you in this way? And in this particular case, it is, Lord, what do I need to obey you? What do I need to obey you in? In what area of my life have I been disobedient? Ask the Lord to convict you of that. Ask the Lord to show you what areas you need to obey him in, where he has called you to obey, and then honor him in that way.
So the first thing that he tells us regarding his will for our lives is that he wants me to obey him. But the second thing he says as we come to verses 3 and 4 is that God wants my devotion. He wants me not only to obey him, which could be described as obedience out of duty or responsibility, but, but what he wants is for us to obey him with hearts that are devoted to him. And so his desire for us, his will for our lives is our devotion. Devotion leads to unwavering faith to love God. He says, let, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God. And man, the calling on our lives is to be devoted to Him, to have unwavering, steadfast love, steadfast faithfulness. Do not let it forsake us. That's not possible in our own strength. By the Holy Spirit of God at work within us, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are called to have devotion to Him, an unwavering faith to love Him, to hold on to the truth of the gospel, to not let it waver from one side or to the other, to not get lost in, 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 in liberal theology, to not get lost in the things that would turn us away from the truth of who God is, but instead to focus our hearts on Him, to be unwavering in our devotion, for Him to be the center of everything that we do in life. He says he's pleased with us when we are faithful to him. We will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. And honestly, who would not want that? Who does not want to say that they have found favor in the sight of God, in the sight of man? We are called to be devoted to him. So if we ask ourselves, God, what is your will for my life? He says, obey me. Then he says, be devoted to me. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We've got to be devoted in our walk with him. Consider this, whenever someone is asked, what's the most important thing in your life? And rank the most important things in your life. Very often, if someone is a follower of Christ, they'll say, well, the most important thing in my life is God. And then number two is my wife or my family. Number three is my church. Number four is my job. And they go through this process of listing out what's most important and then what is less important by degrees. The problem with that scenario, though, is that it compartmentalizes our faith in God. You see, I don't believe that God wants to be just number one in the list of things that are important. I think God wants to be in all. So rather than thinking of our lives as a list of what's most important, what's second important, and so forth, we really should look at our lives as a circle. And out here I have my work, and out here I have my family, and here I have all of these different aspects of my life, but in the center is my relationship with the Lord. And that spokes out into every other area of my life. My relationship with God impacts everything else. And everything else is subject to and submitted to my relationship with the Lord. He is not number one in a list of things that are important to me. He is important to me. He is the only thing that is important to me. And through Him, everything else finds their purpose. I become a better family man because of who God is and what He's doing in my life. I am better at my job because of who God is and what he's doing in my life. I'm a better church member because of who God is and how he's at work in my life. Everything is submitted to and devoted to my relationship with the Lord. God wants my devotion. So as we think about then how we would confess and seek God's will in our own lives, perhaps we need to ask ourselves the question, Lord, what, in what area of my life do I need to be more faithful In what area of my life have I not been faithful to you? What area of my life is not devoted to you or submitted to you? God wants my devotion. So he says he wants us to obey him. He says he wants us to be devoted to him. And then the third truth that we see in this passage is that God wants me to trust him completely. We get to those verses that we we know so, so well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Notice in those verses that the word all is used twice. We trust in the Lord with all of our heart, 
and we acknowledge Him in all of our ways. There was a television program that preceded the 1988 Winter Olympics, and it featured blind skiers being trained for slalom skiing. Impossible as that sounds. They were paired with sighted skiers, and then the blind skiers were taught on the flats how to make right and left turns. When that was mastered, they were taken to the slalom slope where their sighted partners skied beside them shouting left and right. And as they obeyed the commands, they were able to negotiate the course and cross the finish line, depending solely on the sighted skier's word. It was either complete trust on their part or catastrophe. What a vivid picture of the Christian life that is. In this world, we are in reality blind about what course we should take. Nothing has proven that more than the situation that we find ourselves in globally right now. Nobody is sure about anything. We must rely solely on the word of the only one who truly has sight, who can see yesterday, today, and tomorrow, God himself. His word gives us the direction we need to be able to finish the the race, to finish the course. But the truth of the matter is, if God wants us to trust him, we cannot trust him if we don't need him. I, I cannot trust God. I won't want to trust God if I don't understand my need for him. In verse 5, we're told to not lean on our own understanding. The problem so many of us face is that we don't think that we need God. We don't think that we have any need for his guidance. We think we've got it under control. But God says, don't lean on your own understanding because you can't see what's ahead. There's an old story of a father who took his young son out, stood him on the railing of the back porch. He then went down and stood on the lawn and encouraged the little fellow to jump into his arms. I'll catch you, the father said confidently. So after a lot of coaxing, the little boy finally made the leap. When he did, his dad stepped back and let the child fall to the ground. He then picked his son up, dusted him off, and dried his tears and said this, Let that be a lesson. Don't ever trust anyone. Well, that's unfortunately the way so many people approach life. And even worse, that's the way many of us approach our relationship with God. If we don't think that we can trust Him, if we don't understand His trustworthiness, if we don't see our need for Him, then we don't trust Him. We think that we are self-made. We have done it ourselves. We've gotten ourselves to where we are. There's actually the belief out there, perhaps you've heard this, that The belief that somewhere in the Bible it says something along the lines of God helps those that help themselves. Well, the truth of the matter is the Bible does not say that. The teachings of Scripture are that instead we are incapable of doing anything good apart from Christ. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 64 that all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Compared to the goodness of God, even the good things that we do, even the righteous things that we do, are like filthy rags to Him. We have nothing good to bring to the table. And so for us to, in our pride, say, I don't need God, we are seriously deceiving ourselves. We must understand our need for Him and trust Him. Trust God if we don't know Him. He says in verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge, it it means to know. It means to to be focused on who he is, to understand and know him. In all your ways, know him. If we don't know him, we can't trust him. So let me pause for a second and say, if you're watching this today and you don't know God, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, placed your faith in him, and understood that you are a sinner and apart from Christ, you have no relationship with God, but that while we were still sinners, Christ came, He lived a perfect sinless life, and then died in our place, taking on Himself the wrath that we deserve from God. If that's where you are today, and you've never trusted in faith in Christ, I pray that today is the day that you will do that. Because in order to be able to trust Him, in order to be able to walk in His will for our lives and trust Him, even though we can't see what comes tomorrow, even though we don't know how this pandemic will come to an end, the truth of the matter is God does. He is in control. He is 
on the throne and we can absolutely trust Him. But in order to trust Him, we have to know Him. And so I hope that you know Him today. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And you can trust that when He makes that promise, He will fulfill it. He will keep that promise because He is absolutely trustworthy. His will is for us to trust Him. We also can't trust Him if we deceive ourselves. He says in verse 7, Do not be wise in your own eyes. That, that word wise, it literally means skillful, shrewd, cunning. It can even mean religious. Hear this very carefully. The writer of Proverbs could also be translated here as saying, do not be skillful in your own eyes, or do not be shrewd or cunning in your own eyes, or even worse still, do not be religious in your own eyes. I fear that too many times we go through the motions of religion, we go through the motions of thinking that we are doing all right before God because we, we, we gather with our church family, we show up at all the right times, we do all the religious things, we perhaps even can say all of the right religious words, but we don't know Him. And in such, we are giving ourselves too much credit, we are deceiving ourselves, destroying our ability to actually be able to trust Him. Verse 7 goes on, he says, Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. The truth of the matter is, if we're living in sin, if we're allowing sin to, to have its way in our lives, we can't trust God. Our trust of Him is dependent on, upon us receiving forgiveness for our sins and then allowing Him to work in us as a new creation in Christ. He says, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Essentially what he's saying there is that we need to repent of any sin so that we can trust Him. Truthfully, sin will keep us from trusting God because so many times we think that it is our uh, calling and responsibility to, to, to do whatever we're doing, to, to be able to, to hold on to life and to, to, to be able to, to walk in a way that, um, that we want to go. But our hearts are sinful apart from Christ. And so the way that we want to go is going to be deceived by the sin that is in our life. He says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. He's saying, repent, turn back. In John chapter 3, we have this that is said about, about Jesus. It says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, talking about Jesus, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. There's a clear distinction here. We either are walking in the light as those who are in Christ, or we are walking in darkness as those who are choosing to walk in sin. It is only those who are in Christ who are truly able to be obedient to what God has commanded to trust Him, to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. When we're following after a life and a pathway of sin, we are not trusting in God. I cannot trust God if I live in sin. And truthfully, I can only know the right way when I put my trust in Him. Did you hear verse 8? It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. We're only able to know the, the right way to go when our trust is in God alone. Not when we're trusting in ourselves, not when we're thinking that we have all the answers, but instead when we are trusting in Him alone. So as we think about this in light of the question that's before us today, God, what's your will for my life? He has said that his will for us is to obey him, to be devoted to him, and to trust him. Perhaps the next question we need to ask ourselves is, Lord, in what ways do I need to trust you? Lord, what area of my life have I not trusted you? What area of my life have I not trusted that you are working for my good? What area of my life is, is so focused in on what I want to do, perhaps it's because of my pleasures or because of fear, I'm afraid to let go of this particular area of life, I'm afraid of what changes will happen if I trust you in this area of my life, if I trust you with my family, or if I trust you with my job, I don't know what might happen. Perhaps fear has stopped you <coughs> from trusting in the Lord. So perhaps the question you need to ask today is, Lord, in what area of my life do I need to trust you? Lord, where, are, where am I not trusting you? What have I not obeyed because I don't trust you? His will for your life and mine is that we trust him in all of our ways. 
But not only that, the fourth thing that he says, as we continue on, verses 9 and 10, he tells us that, that we need to honor him. He uses the example of money to explain how we can honor him. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, that your barns may be filled with plenty and your vats be bursting with wine. The writer of Proverbs makes a distinction between the tithe and honoring the Lord with our wealth. He said we need to do both. I think a lot of times we think, well, as long as I've given money at the church, therefore I'm honoring the Lord with my wealth. But the truth is that's not always The case, we can give money to the church and still not be honoring the Lord in the way that we spend the remainder of our wealth. We need to tithe, but we also need to honor the Lord with our wealth. If we have money that we're hoarding, if we're looking to hold on to what God has given to us for selfish reasons, when there's kingdom work to be done, when there's ways that we can bless others, when there's ways that we can honor the Lord, then we are living in sin because we're not honoring him with what he has given to us. Too many times we're like a little girl that I recently heard about. There was this mother who wanted to teach her daughter a moral lesson, so she gave the little girl a quarter and a dollar for church. And she said this, you choose, put whatever one you want in the collection plate, and you keep the other one for yourself. When they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter, given the dollar or the quarter? Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the dollar, but just before the collection, the man in the pulpit said that we should all be cheerful givers. And I knew I'd be a whole lot more cheerful. I think a lot of times we think that we would be a whole lot more happy if we had this, that, or the other. But what the Lord says to us is that we need to honor Him with our wealth, that our joy is to be found in Him, not in the things that we acquire. And so what he's getting to the heart of is our heart. What is it that we love? Remember, we've already talked about his will for our lives is to obey him and to be devoted to him, to love him. But one of the ways that we show our love is the way in which we honor him with what he has given to us. When we understand that, that he has not given us these things so that we can hold on to them and worship them and find joy in them and honor them. The truth of the matter is, what he's called us to is honor him with everything that we have. To realize that all of the things that we have accumulated, all of the things that we possess, are simply temporary and will not last. And the only thing that is eternal is our relationship with him. So honor the Lord with all that you have. He says that we will be blessed when we do that. That we will receive blessing beyond our even imagination. Now, when we hear that, it's very easy to drop off into the health and wealth gospel mentality to think, well, God's going to give me even more. And that's not necessarily the case. But the promise is this, that when we seek joy in the Lord, when we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, we will be blessed in ways we can't even imagine. So perhaps the question we need to ask ourselves in this particular instance, is, Lord, in what way do I need to honor you? Or maybe another way to ask it is, Lord, what, what have I been holding on to that I'm worshiping, that I'm giving the worship that you deserve? What am I not honoring you with in my life? Perhaps it's wealth, perhaps it's possessions, perhaps it's uh, family relationships. It, it could be any number of things. But if we're living for that thing instead of for the Lord... We are not honoring him with that thing. And using the example of money, he really gets to the heart of something that that every one of us struggles with, the desire and the want for more that's a part of our natural sinful human condition. He says, what you need to understand is, in everything, you are to honor me. You are to bring honor to my name. So we're to obey him, we're to be devoted to him, we're to trust him, we are to honor him. And then he finally says, as he wraps up these 12 verses, that he wants us to grow in our faith. God wants me to grow in my faith. He says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Essentially what he's telling us is that we grow in our faith when we allow ourselves to learn from God's discipline when we allow ourselves to be trained by the discipline of the Lord. Dennis Miller tells a story 
of parenting his son. He says, out of parental concern and with a desire to teach our young son responsibility, we require him to phone home when he arrives at his friend's house that's just a few blocks away. He began to forget, however, as he grew more confident in his ability to get there without disaster coming upon him. The first time he forgot, I called to make sure that he had arrived. We told him the next time it happened, he would have to come home. A few days later, however, the telephone again lay silent, and I knew if he was going to learn, he would have to be punished. But I did not want to punish him. I went to the telephone, regretting that his great time would be spoiled by his lack of contact with his father. As I dialed, I prayed for wisdom. Treat him like I treat you, the Lord seemed to say. With that, as the telephone rang one time, I hung up. A few seconds later, the phone rang one time, and it was my son. I'm here, Dad. What took you so long to call, I asked. Well, we started playing and I forgot, but Dad, I heard the phone ring once and I remembered. How often do we think of God as the one who wants to punish us when we step out of line? I wonder how often he rings just once, hoping we will phone home. Now, I don't know about the theology of Dennis Miller's thought there, but it it is interesting. We realize just how loving and merciful that God is so often with us, putting up with the things that we do that don't honor Him, the ways that we don't obey Him, the situations in which we don't trust Him, the many variety of ways that we're not devoted to Him. And yet in it, in love, He disciplines us and and seeks to restore us into right relationship with Him, to grow us in our faith so that the next time we face one of those situations, we will trust Him. The next time we're given the choice, we will obey Him. We will honor Him with what we have. He wants us to grow in our faith. It's His will that we grow, that we not remain as babies, as spiritual babies in the faith, but instead that that we grow up into mature people who are being made into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We can't grow if we resent His correction. It's not not possible for us to, to grow if we're constantly frustrated by His discipline and correction. But instead, if we want to experience His love, We have to receive His discipline because He is disciplining us for our good that we will grow in our faith. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says this, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you were left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you were illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. The good news is that God disciplines those that he loves. And there's also this interesting moment where the writer of Hebrews specifically says that if you're being disciplined, you're being treated as sons and not illegitimate children. Here on Mother's Day, that doesn't mean that God doesn't like women or is not interested in relationship with you ladies. In fact, it's quite the opposite. At the time that this is being written, uh, what was understood is that the only ones who were able to receive the inheritance of their father were the sons. And so what he's saying to every one of us, whether we are male or female, is this. If God is disciplining you, if God is bringing discipline into your life so that you will grow in your faith, it is proving that he loves you and you are his. You are a part of the inheritance. You are sharing in the the family of faith. You are a son of God because he and he's showing that because he is disciplining you. He is showing you love. And so his will is that we grow in our walk with him. And sometimes that discipline may be like what Dennis Miller uh, shared there. It may be just that, that one reminder phone call. It may also be a very difficult season of trials that we walk through as God is getting our attention and moving us from where we were to where he wants us to be. But regardless of what form his discipline takes, this is the truth. He disciplines those whom he loves. So do not despise the Lord's discipline. Don't resent it. In fact, rejoice in it because it's proof that God loves you and is not willing to leave you in sin, but instead is forming you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So to recap, the question that's before us today is, God, what's your will for my life? And he answers it with those five things. He wants us to obey him. He wants us to follow him in everything. To 
to walk in obedience in every area of our life. He wants us to be devoted to Him in all of our ways, that He is the one that we worship. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to, to, um, to, to seek His wisdom, to seek His guidance, His counsel. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to believe that whatever is around the next corner, we trust that He is working for our good and for His glory. We trust Him. He wants us to honor Him. He has blessed us as in so many ways. And He wants us to honor Him with everything that we have, with everything that we do. We need to think of our lives in such a way that I don't just go to my job, but I work that I might honor the Lord in it. I don't just have a family, but I interact with my family and I love my family in order to honor the Lord in everything that I do. And I don't just have wealth and possessions. I have what God has given to me that I might honor Him with it all. He wants us to honor Him. And then finally, He wants us to grow in our faith. So maybe the question we ask in that one is this. Lord, I know that You love me. And I know that You love me because You discipline me in this particular way. And so, Lord, I want you to show me and remind me how you have disciplined me so that I can see your love at work in my life. And ask him to look back through your life and remind you of the ways that he's disciplining. And if you're walking through a season of discipline right now, be reminded that it is not because God is angry with you. It's not because he is a vengeful, hateful God. Instead, he is a loving father who wants you to not remain in your sin, but instead to lead you into righteousness by the power of His Holy Spirit because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So rejoice in the Lord's discipline in your life. I don't know what you may be facing today. I don't know what kind of circumstances or questions you may be facing in terms of what God's will is in those particular circumstances, but I can tell you this. If your heart desire is to be obedient to what God has commanded, to be devoted to God in all that you do, to trust in Him with all of your heart, to honor Him with everything that you have, and to grow in your faith, God will be at work in your life and His will will be accomplished in your life. Let your focus be to honor Him, to trust Him, to obey Him, to be devoted to Him, and let Him grow you that Christ might be exalted in your life, that others might see Jesus in you, might be able to see the change in you, and say, what's happening? What is it that's caused you to be No longer the person you were, but the person you are now. Let God work in you that you might be a living example of the power of His Holy Spirit and the joy of walking in faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank You for Your Word today. Lord, I thank You for the reminder in it that You do have a will for each of us. You you have a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. And Lord, You've called us to be obedient to You. Lord, You've called us to uh, be devoted to You, to trust You, to honor You, to grow in our faith as we do those things. And Lord, today I pray that we would apply Your Word rightly to our lives. Lord God, I pray for those who are uh, watching this morning, Lord, who are hearing Your Word proclaimed. Lord, I pray that that you would be at work in our hearts, that we would not be content to just sit back and be spectators in the Christian life. But Lord, that we would get up and be active in our faith. Lord, that we would indeed obey the commands that you've given us to obey. That we would, Lord, honor you and be devoted to you. That we would trust you, no matter what twists and turns come in our life, that we would be people who trust you because we know that you are good and you are working for our good. Lord, that we would honor you and that we would be people who grow in our faith. So Lord, today we pray that all of those things will be true of us. And that as we live out our lives, the name of Jesus will be exalted in us. Lord, now as we sing and respond to your word, Be glorified in us. Focus our hearts on you. May you be the center of everything in our lives. Lord, we love you and praise you. 
We thank you for this time together around your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Even though we're separated in our homes, it is good to know that the people of God are gathering together online to be able to worship the Lord together. And so thank you for being here. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad that you were a part of our worship today. And uh, if you'll follow the the link to uh, psbchurch.net forward slash connect, there is a connect card there. We'd love to know a little more about you and be able to get you some more information about our church family. There's also a, uh, a link on that, that site to be able to share prayer requests and to share any decision that you made during today's service. Uh, that link will also be available in the description on the Facebook video and on the YouTube video. It's been so good to worship the Lord together today. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we'll go out singing together. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the privilege of gathering together 
as your people. And so, Lord, today, as we end our time of worship, Lord, may our hearts continue worshiping. May we be reminded that we are your people and we are here to declare your glory in our world. So, Lord, be glorified in us. Help us to focus our hearts on you even as we go about the remainder of our day. Lord, we love you and praise you. We thank you so much uh, for all you've done. We thank you for our mothers and that we get to honor them this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.